We begin, as always, with a history of public health and an illustration of how it's tied uh, to the prevention of communicable diseases. Uh, Although public health touches on many aspects of uh, our lives and um, our experience, uh, probably the thing that comes to mind first and foremost is the uh, role of the public health powers of government as they are employed to battle communicable disease and the spread of disease. And they do this primarily through the powers of social distancing, which involve quarantine, isolation or separation, and direct observed therapy. So step one in the process is to assess the scope and the impact of uh, communicable conditions on human health. Communicable conditions are defined according to the New York Health Code 2010 as an illness caused by an infectious agent or its toxins that occurs through the direct or indirect transmission of the infectious agent or its products. Communicable communicable conditions are transmitted in any number of ways. Uh, One way that they are transmitted is through the air. These are the airborne conditions. Uh, In this context, uh, we consider influenza. We consider, of course, COVID-19. Some are communicated through casual contact, like uh, chicken pox, uh, perhaps mumps. Um, Others, uh, as a uh, uh, communication uh, between mother and child, as in the case of HIV. Others are communicated through uh, an exchange or contact with bodily fluids or blood, such as STDs. Others require living vectors like animals, insects, and plants. Uh, You'll remember when we talked about the historical uh, Justinian's plague and the Black Plague, um, those required uh, the intersection of humans, fleas, and rats. Uh, Lyme disease also, uh, if you think about deer ticks and deer uh, and the disease uh, in in humans, uh, is one of these examples of a communicable condition requiring living vectors. And the sixth way that these can be communicated is through water and food. Uh, In this context, we'll consider the examples of E. coli or salmonella. Some of the deadliest pandemics in modern history have been the Spanish flu of 1918 to 1919, where it is estimated that uh, across the globe, 100 million uh, uh, died. More recently, H1N1, 2009-2010, millions were infected, tens of thousands killed, according to the World Health Organization. Recently, in 2013, um, drug-resistant strains of TB uh, were blamed for the deaths of as many as one and a half million people. And then, of course, we have COVID-19, which is with us now, and the picture continues to develop, but some of the more recent statistics may be helpful. As of May 28, 2020, COVID-19 had been detected in 188 nations, resulting in almost 5.4 million cases and uh, 360,000 deaths. In the U.S. alone, uh, we had nearly 1.8 million cases. That number will surely exceed 2 million before we are finished and uh, 102,000, almost 103,000 deaths as of May 28th. In New Jersey, uh, 158,700 cases as of May 28th with 11,400 deaths. Public health powers uh, basically fall into one of three categories. There are the voluntary ones, the mandatory ones, and the compulsory ones. Uh, the severity of the uh, exercise of power uh, increases as we go from one to three. Uh, 
and um, of course legal scrutiny on those powers and the ability of government to exercise them also increases as we go from voluntary to compulsory. Voluntary public health powers involve educational campaigns like the anti-drug campaigns. Uh, think of the example of uh, the old commercial, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs with the egg in the frying pan. Uh, think about the, um, uh, the anti-smoking uh, uh, public service announcements we see on television depicting the very graphic damage that smoking can do on the lungs. Uh, sex education falls into this category, contraceptive distribution programs, vaccine drives, and testing and screening. Testing and screening, of course, is done for any number of conditions, everything from um, baseline concussion testing for uh, screening for uh, young athletes uh, to uh, uh, COVID uh, antibody screening, uh, which is being done now. The advantage of these voluntary public health powers is that they don't run into legal uh, problems because they are primarily uh, or essentially voluntary. No one's making anyone do these things. Uh, the testing that we do for COVID would involve us getting into a car and going to a test site and asking for the test. And no one is requiring us to have the test. Um, it's uh, consistent with public health ethics and it's favored by society as long as these uh, measures which are uh, being uh, offered voluntarily are considered to be effective. The next step are mandatory powers. These are a little bit more onerous, uh, and although they are not uh, compulsory, in other words, uh, the individual uh, still has some choice, you'll see why the, uh, the law regards these somewhat differently. Mandatory public health um, measures often set conditions for the participation in some activity uh, in which the individual wants to participate. So let's think about uh, school vaccinations. Um, uh, it is a condition for the attendance in school that you are able to uh, demonstrate that you have had all the appropriate vaccinations. There are exceptions to this. We'll discuss them later in this lecture. Uh, another example is from your famous case of Jacobson versus Massachusetts. Uh, with which you're quite familiar by now. And in Jacobson, as you'll remember, his choice was to either be vaccinated or to be fined. Uh, so this was an example of a mandatory vaccination um, uh, program. Uh, screening and testing and treatment can often uh, be mandatory where participation is required to avoid more intrusive measures. Someone faced with the choice of uh, either screen or test or take a particular treatment or will have to quarantine you or isolate you uh, has a uh, choice perhaps, although the choice is coerced. So even though there is choice because there is also coercion, legal challenges can result. As you remember, Jacobson was a mandatory uh, vaccination program. He did have some choices, but he did litigate it, and that law was upheld. Finally, we get to compulsory public health powers. In compulsory public health powers, the individual has no choice at all but to subject him or herself to those powers. Compliance is enforced by law. Uh, an example from the early 20th century would have been the program in New York City where uh, smallpox vaccinations were given forcibly on a door-to-door -door basis. Uh, also, a, a 1918 law, a federal law called the Chamberlain Con Act required that prostitutes be subjected to treatment and study. Uh, so that law was uh, later repealed and it's easy to understand why obviously uh, uh, a, a compulsory law like that uh, would have caused some legal problems. Uh, compulsory powers are rarely used today because for the most part, governments can use less intrusive and less restrictive, less onerous 
measures to accomplish the same goal, and the courts and the law require them to use those if they can. Uh, so they fail to survive in most circumstances constitutional scrutiny, even where the government has a compelling interest. As long as the government can can get the job done, as I mentioned before, by using a less restrictive or less burdensome method. There are exceptions. Um, forcible HIV testing for sexually transmitted diseases uh, is uh, one of the permitted exceptions, as is uh, sometimes quarantine and isolation. Uh, later, we will talk about the case of Casey Hickox, American nurse, working with Doctors Without Borders in West Africa in 2013 during the Ebola epidemic and the quarantine and isolation to which she was involuntarily subjected upon her return to the United States. And finally, in the parens patriae context with minors and prisoners, uh, the compulsory powers uh, have been held to be permissible. So uh, when the public health authorities or the government are confronted with a public health crisis in the form of communicable disease, the first step, of course, is the identification of the disease or pathogen. And uh, uh, the next step, of course, is screening and testing to find out who's been infected by it, how widespread uh, the infection is and to help them uh, use these, uh, the data gathered in this way to design uh, mitigation and treatment plans. Uh, so the next step there would be testing and screening, and these are really two different concepts. Testing uh, is conducted to determine the presence or absence of a disease in a particular individual. Screening are tests or procedures designed to ascertain the presence or absence of disease among a population. Uh, an example of screening would have been um, uh, the screening of air travelers returning from West Africa to American airports in 2014. They were screened upon re-entry to the country. Generally speaking, uh, there's not a big legal issue with uh, testing and screening, especially if it's non-invasive. Uh, but uh, the other conditions that the law imposes on screening and testing is that there's some communication in the form of pre- and post-testing counseling. What are you testing for? Why are you testing me? And uh, what will become of the information once you determine it from the test? Uh, the counseling that goes on after a test is developed and it's determined that someone is positive for a disease is also important here. Uh, advanced informed consent, that means in, if, obtaining the informed consent of the person to be tested before they're tested. Uh, is critical uh, because uh, without it, you don't have a voluntary act. You don't have voluntarism. Uh, the testing and screening should be non-coercive uh, generally, which means that it's uh, in the voluntary public powers domain, not even mandatory and certainly not compulsory. And four, uh, uh, the testing and screening should avoid the unwarranted classification of protected groups. So we would not want to say, for instance, that we were going to uh, test only people who, whose national origin was China because we think that this disease originated in China. That would be unwarranted, it would be unfounded, it would not serve a valid scientific purpose and uh, therefore it would probably be uh, struck down on a constitutional uh, legal basis. HIV testing uh, is generally administered uh, using uh, an opt-out provision uh, during the course of routine physicals and treatment. Uh, previously, the policy on HIV testing was more sharply focused on what the public health 
world determined to be high risk groups, which would be gay men, intravenous drug users, and pregnant women. The potential violation of bodily and informational privacy guaranteed by the substantive due process clause of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments come into play here. Non-consensual testing uh, begins to implicate some legal issues in terms of privacy rights and even the Fourth Amendment. So if the testing involves the collection of blood, tissue samples, or DNA, uh, it comes within the purview of the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, which says that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated except on probable cause. Okay, this, when we think about the Fourth Amendment, we think about the police breaking down a door and searching a house or searching the trunk of a car for contraband or weapons or stolen goods. But a search can also be the collection uh, against someone's will of their uh, tissue samples, their hair, uh, their blood. And under those circumstances, the government is required to show special need. A case in your text uh, is uh, Ferguson versus City of Charleston from 2001. There, a state hospital, and this is important because remember the Constitution protects us from the actions of government, federal and state. Here, a state hospital had a program uh, which involved a non-consensual drug testing of new mothers and pregnant women. And the purpose of it was to identify women who had exposed their fetuses to illicit drugs. The problem is that positive results were reported to law enforcement and the women were often uh, arrested and prosecuted. Uh, so uh, the Supreme Court, uh, considering this law, struck it down, holding that the state was unable to sustain its burden of showing the special need for this. The next step in the uh, public health efforts or the exercise of public health powers after testing and screening would be treatment and therapy. At this point, uh, the disease has been identified uh, and the infection uh, confirmed in an individual or a group of individuals. And the government or the public health officials at this point are, are uh, then tasked with coming up with a treatment or a therapy. Now, testing and screening is fine, and if it's effective, uh, it, it can be the first and best tool for matching a public health emergency involving communicable disease. However, it doesn't do any good unless it's matched up with uh, an effective treatment. Uh, in the case of COVID, if you remember at the beginning, there was uh, a shortage of test kits. So the testing wasn't being done uh, as uh, frequently as it should have been. Once the test kits were in place, um, we were in better shape. However, to, the, to date, we still don't have a, an effective treatment for the symptoms of COVID-19. And we continue to work toward a vaccination, which would be a preventative, but not a treatment. Uh, some of the funding um, uh, cutbacks uh, have affected public health clinics across the land, and this has hampered to some degree our ability to respond to public health crises like COVID-19. But when we think about treatment and therapy, we have to put on our ethical hats and think about whether or not what we're doing uh, is consistent with ethical considerations. If an effective treatment exists, then the failure to make it available to positive cases is unethical. Involuntary treatment is okay, provided there's informed consent. That's kind of an oxymoron because consent means voluntary. Uh, uh, so what we're saying is that voluntary treatment is okay with informed consent. And of course, treatment as a condition to participate is okay. Uh, 
provided, and here's where science comes in, uh, the person or uh, potentially constitutes a health risk to others. The treatment does not involve a, a, an enhanced risk of greater harm. The treatment is consistent with current standards of medical care and procedural due process protections are observed. We haven't talked a lot about due process yet, but due process is guaranteed by the 5th and 14th Amendments, and it comes in uh, two varieties. One is substantive due process, which are the actual rights that we enjoy under the Constitution, and procedural due process has more to do with um, the process by which the government enforces its laws or exercises its powers when it comes to an individual. Uh, so if the uh, government were to uh, impose an isolation uh, upon an individual, procedural due process would require notice to that individual and an opportunity to be heard. That is to say, hey, you got the wrong guy. I'm not sick. Let me prove it to you. Uh, and uh, failing that, access to a, an impartial tribunal or shorthand uh, to the courts with the representation of adequate counsel to represent the individual's interests and um, uh, defend uh, his personal or her personal liberties in the process. That's procedural due process. And we'll talk about more about it talk more about it as we go on a little bit further. Treatment uh, uh, is of different types. There is the DOT, direct observed therapy, which is uh, where therapy is administered by a healthcare worker or a family member working under the direction or supervision of a healthcare worker. And this is okay legally. Um, another is expedited partner therapy, EPT, where uh, we end up treating both the patient and the sexual partner of the patient in STD cases. Uh, the legal problem with EPT is, of course, um, uh, the possibility of an adverse drug reaction in the partner who has not really been diagnosed, but who is being given the treatment on a prophylactic basis. Uh, or the misuse of antibiotics, which could lead to antibiotic resistance, or professional liability uh, in the issuance of prescriptions without a medical examination. Forced treatment uh, has been frowned upon by the Supreme Court, and this comes down to the 5th and 14th Amendment uh, amendments and the uh, substantive due process uh, privacy rights that they uh, confer on us as individuals. The Supreme Court has ruled that individual liberties include the right to refuse treatment. Uh, however, there are exceptions. So in the prison context, in the case of Riggins versus Nevada mentioned in your text, um, compulsory medications could be given to prisoners with communicable diseases uh, to safeguard the safety of uh, other prisoners uh, in that facility. Uh, but the circumstances under which treatment can be forced is exceedingly rare. Um, another is contact tracing, partner notification in the case of STDs or HIV. Um, this requires special care because it... Uh, treads on the privacy rights of the contact and the right to anonymity of the informant. Sometimes, however, it's impossible to preserve uh, the anonymity of the informant and still get the public health uh, job done. Uh, so the law has recognized that this is a difficult situation and uh, uh, we're counseled to do the best we can to strike the balance, to preserve and protect those rights to the extent we reasonably can. Um, criminal sexual contact uh, with minors can give rise to a Fifth Amendment self-incrimination problem. As you know, or if you don't know, look at your Constitution. The Fifth Amendment gives us the privilege of... Uh, not being compelled to testify against ourselves uh, in a criminal case. This means that uh, if uh, an individual uh, 
uh, diagnosed with a sexually transmitted disease uh, were interviewed by a public health official who were then who was then uh, tasked with doing contact tracing and uh, asked of this uh, patient uh, who their sexual partners were uh, if that um, patient were to reveal that one of the contacts was a minor uh, a minor then he would in fact uh, be admitting um, his responsibility for a major criminal act so this could impact uh, the fifth amendment right against self-incrimination it's an interesting question Contact tracing, of course, in COVID-19 is uh, going to be very important, although I don't know that anyone knows who patient zero was. Uh, the cat was kind of out of the bag uh, by the time we started thinking about this. So we have been doing some tracing, but the most effective tracing, of course, would be to identify patient zero and go from there. Um, Google and Facebook uh, have thrown their know-how and, and weight and um, wealth uh, behind the uh, effort to do the tracing using their technology. Uh, while this might be very effective uh, in the sense that uh, it could save public health officials a lot of effort uh, in doing tracing the old fashioned way, um, it may also violate individual uh, privacy uh, rights under the Constitution. So uh, this has to be watched. It is uh, potentially a very useful tool, but it could also be abused. Vaccination. Vaccination comes up um, as uh, probably the greatest public health breakthrough of the 20th century. Uh, it's resulted in saving millions of lives and lessening the burden on the public health system and generally helping the advance of, the, uh, of our uh, uh, economy and culture, uh, not just in the United States, but around the world. Vaccines, as you know, are approved by the Food and Drug Administration and the uh, CDC uh, maintains an advisory committee on immunization practices, which makes vaccination recommendations. Right now, CDC is quite busy um, working on the COVID-19 vaccination with a, a variety of pharmaceutical companies around the world. And someone will get the big, uh, uh, will, will get it right. And uh, they will, uh, of course, make that vaccine available to the world. And we'll hope that it's effective uh, to prevent, uh, you know, a further outbreak of this disease uh, come flu season uh, a few months from now. Mandatory vaccinations uh, are a reality in all 50 states as a condition for the attendance of school. Uh, to attend school, you must have you know, vaccination against measles, rubella, mumps, and, and other things. The city of New York, um, a little while back, tried to add uh, to the vaccination requirement a flu shot every year. However, the court struck that down as not being properly grounded in medical science. The flu vaccine, as we know, is not always effective. The flu mutates. Uh, sometimes we have a good vaccine and sometimes it kind of misses the mark. So the court did not think that there was a sufficient scientific basis to make it a mandatory vaccination for the attendance at school. The Supreme Court has upheld the use of vaccinations to control communicable disease. As you know, again, we'll mention the Jacobson case, which keeps coming up. Uh, and uh, later in uh, 1922, the school vaccination program uh, was upheld by the Supreme Court. Most of our school vaccine programs are basically modeled on uh, uh, that Zucked model uh, and are uh, respectful of uh, the ruling of the Supreme Court there. Uh, so it's generally been held to be okay to require vaccines for those diseases as a condition to attending school, provided that uh, certain exemptions are permitted. One of those exemptions is a religious exemption, and all but California, Mississippi, and West Virginia uh, 
allow religious exemptions. This would involve someone saying that they uh, are prohibited from taking the vaccination uh, because of their particular religious beliefs. In 20 states, there is also a philosophical exemption for people who don't have a traditional religious conviction about vaccinations, but who believe for whatever reason, sincerely, it's always supposed to be sincere, uh, that uh, they should not or uh, cannot take a vaccination. The problem with vaccinations is that they're much too easy to get or have become easy to get. Uh, you fill out a form, you sign a certification, and it would be processed at the school board level or at the Department of Health level. And you would then be exempt and your child would be allowed to attend school without the vaccinations. Because they've been so easy to get and because the exemptions have been misused, abused, um, this has uh, led to uh, increases in uh, infections. Uh, there was a measles outbreak uh, over the last couple of years in uh, different parts of the country, but around here, uh, the one that comes to mind is the one in uh, Rockland County, uh, New York. <clears throat> Uh, there's much information in the air about vaccinations. There is an anti-vax movement, which maintains that there are medical reasons not to take vaccinations, one of which is the claim that vaccinations uh, are a root cause of autism. I think this has largely been discredited, but it's still out there and a, and a, a subject of some debate. Uh, Exemptions, uh, when they become so prevalent, lead to lower inoculation rates and more frequent outbreaks. So this becomes uh, more and more a uh, major concern for public health officials and, um, and government. Uh, the constitutional issues which are implicated when we talk about uh, mandatory vaccinations are, of course, the 14th Amendment, and the PowerPoint uh, identifies the equal protection right there. But I think even more important there would be the substantive due process privacy rights guaranteed by the 5th and 14th Amendments. And then another one which is interesting uh, in the context of religious exemption would be the First Amendment Establishment Free Expression Clause of, of the Constitution. The First Amendment, of course, guarantees our right to practice our religion freely, and it also prohibits the government from establishing a religion. This is why we, unlike England, for instance, do not have a state religion. Uh, in England, um, the Anglican Church, uh, or the Church of England, as it's sometimes called, is the state religion. It doesn't mean you can't practice another religion, but very clearly there is a state religion. Uh, a law here by the government which favors one religion over another or, uh, or any religion over no religion at all would violate the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. And uh, we'll talk about some very interesting and specific examples um, when we get into uh, the social distancing discussion in a few minutes. Uh, but suffice it to say that uh, uh, religion will come into play not in a vaccination context, but in the uh, social distancing context in case study number one. New Jersey's been working to eliminate its religious exemption for some time through uh, legislation, uh, and they have not been able to get enough support in the legislature to get the bill passed. Most recently, uh, their uh, efforts were defeated in January by a coalition of anti-vaxxers and ultra-Orthodox Jewish community leaders uh, with the support of some celebrity firepower. And narrowly, uh, that bill was, uh, was struck down. So as of now, there is still a religious exemption in the New Jersey law. There's a link to an article in the New York Times about that. And I've also linked some... Um, articles and uh, uh, videos about, vac about the vaccination debate. Um, and uh, feel free to take a look at them. It's not required. It's not homework. Uh, but um, it is there for you. It is a resource, as I mentioned in our Zoom on Wednesday. I will give you lots of material. And uh, when you look at the Moodle, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed. I want you to feel blessed. Uh, 
that I've given you some resources which you may be able to utilize in your case studies or your final paper. I actually thought it might be a good idea to take a little bit of time and focus uh, more intensely on the social distancing aspect of uh, the public health effort. Um, social distancing is uh, front and center in all of our lives uh, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we've seen our leaders uh, from President Trump down to Governor Murphy and Governor Cuomo in New York talking on a virtually daily basis about uh, the epidemic, the pandemic, uh, the uh, state and federal efforts to combat the spread of the of the uh, uh, of the virus and um, and about the social distancing protocols which were put into place. These protocols, of course, involved uh, virtually the shutdown of the entire national economy, uh, the loss of many jobs, uh, the swelling of the unemployment lines, uh, a lot of pain and suffering, quarantine and isolation for individuals, curfews in towns, and the closing of businesses. So uh, these issues have become very, very important, and uh, I thought we should focus on them a little bit. Uh, first of all, uh, let's remember that social distancing uh, can involve um, obviously quarantine and isolation. And the primary purpose of uh, these measures is to separate at risk individuals from healthy persons. Generally, the people who are infected who are, who, or who are um, uh, suspected to be infected are kept apart from the healthy in order to prevent the transmission of the disease through the community. Isolation and quarantine are quite different in the sense that isolation is the separation of those known to be infected from society and quarantine is the separation of no those who are suspected to have been exposed but whose infection is not yet confirmed um, from society. Uh, quarantine is more like a wait and see. Isolation is uh, the individual is ill and uh, must be isolated until the illness has passed. Normally, social distancing, quarantine, and isolation are not a legal issue because they're most often voluntary and the rights of individuals are generally respected in the process. Uh, as you read your text, um, which was written before COVID-19, I suspect there'll be a new edition soon, which will take some of the lessons learned here in this pandemic and apply them uh, for the benefit of future uh, public health law students. But your text talks about the case of Robert Daniels in Arizona, who had uh, uh, drug-resistant TB and refused to take his med medications. Uh, the state subjected him to 10 months involuntary isolation. He challenged it in court and he lost. The state of Arizona Supreme Court held that this was a proper social distancing measure and a proper exercise of power by the state. Ruby Washington similarly uh, refused to comply with TB, uh, voluntary TB protocols and <clears throat> therefore uh, quarantine was forced on him. Um, we've talked about the fact that most of the social distancing and uh, general uh, public uh, health police powers reside with the state by virtue of the 10th Amendment uh, Reserve Clause. Uh, President Trump, uh, in one of his press conferences, boasted that uh, he had the power to uh, close states down and open them up again. And that's clearly wrong. Uh, those powers are really uh, with the states under the 10th Amendment. But there are some narrow exceptions where the federal government could uh, exercise social distancing powers through the CDC. Uh, federal power under the Constitution is limited to um, certain issues. One of them is interstate commerce. Uh, 
so that the federal government could have the power to limit uh, the uh, travel of individuals between states. Uh, also, they have the right to regulate travel into entry into the United States from other countries. Therefore, the federal government had the right and in fact exercised the right to shut down uh, uh, people flying into the United States during the pandemic. Uh, Andrew Speaker is another example in your text. He's a lawyer who gives lawyers a bad name in the sense that he was suspected of having drug-resistant TB and was directed um, by CDC uh, not to travel out of the country. Speaker went anyway, and uh, when he was located in Italy, CDC uh, contacted Italy through the State Department, put him on a plane, and brought him back. Turns out he didn't have drug-resistant TB, uh, but Speaker sued the federal government and lost. Uh, in 2017, CDC amended their regulations to try to grab, expand their power to act in the case of uh, pandemics. Uh, but most critics seem to think that the um, expansion of CDC social distancing powers through those regulations is probably illegal. It will probably be litigated at some point and then we'll learn for sure. But under uh, principles of federalism, those powers most likely as a first resort uh, reside with the states, not with the federal government. Other social distancing measures include curfew and closure, business closure. Uh, in my town, your town, uh, most towns across the state by mid-March um, had curfews imposed where we would, were not allowed to be out on the street after eight o'clock. Uh, curfews are generally used in extreme uh, times of crisis to address disease, civil unrest, flood, fire. And um, uh, of course, uh, the legal issue with any curfew is the extent to which they impact the constitutional right to travel. Business closures uh, deprive people of livelihood and jobs, uh, yet uh, businesses all across uh, the country were closed except for essential businesses. There's been some litigation about what's essential and what is not, and um, the closures, of course, impacted schools and houses of worship. And it's in the case of the houses of worship that we have some interesting cases working their ways uh, through the court. Just last night, uh, at, at about midnight, the United States Supreme Court in South Bay, the South Bay case, a California case, uh, ruled that um, uh, the governor and the state of California were within their rights in uh, imposing some uh, fairly severe restrictions on the ability of that church and other churches uh, to conduct services. Uh, the church uh, sued the governor, claiming that uh, the uh, rule that he imposed violated the, their First Amendment religious freedoms. Uh, but Justice Roberts, being for the court, uh, disagreed and refused to open the churches, saying that it's within the discretion of the states to make those judgments. Um, I have sent you an email about that case with a uh, link to the case or a copy of the case attached. It's not a long opinion and it's not complicated. I would uh, encourage you to read it and also read the dissent written by Justice Thomas, uh, who takes the opposite point of view. But in a very close decision uh, by a 5-4 vote, the Supreme Court voted to support the, uh, uh, the restrictions imposed by the state of California. There's a similar case in uh, New Jersey called uh, Robinson versus Murphy involving a church in West Caldwell. Father Robinson uh, sued Governor Murphy, claiming that the executive order imposed by Murphy, again, infringed on uh, religious freedoms under the First Amendment. Uh, that case is pending in the U.S. District Court for the District of New Jersey. And I'm monitoring it. So as things happen in that case, I will pass on those developments to you. But I would suspect that the uh, 
that last night's decision in the Supreme Court case in um, South Bay will uh, most likely uh, be the way the court will decide similar cases unless the facts are extremely different. Uh, this one, uh, the Robinson Murphy case, is much like South Bay and I would expect it to come out the same way. Uh, the one thing I will say though is as we lighten our restrictions on social dist distancing, within the next two or three weeks I suspect that churches, mosques, and synagogues in one form or another will be back in business and some of these cases will become moot. Moot is a term that we use in the law to mean that while there may have been a controversy at one point, uh, the facts have developed to such a degree that uh, there's no longer any disagreement. Uh, and therefore, when there's no disagreement, there's no case. So let's see what happens with Robinson and Murphy. And let me just give you a clue that uh, this religious liberty concept will be worked into the first case study. So generally speaking, to sum up, social distancing protocols and measures undertaken by government, mainly state governments and sometimes federal governments, are going to be okay and will pass legal scrutiny provided that there's a reasonable suspicion of exposure and provided that the subject of the measure, the quarantine, the isolation, uh, is shown to uh, pose a specific threat. And the terms of the isolation or quarantine are humane and the confinement is justified, supported by science as necessary. Group confinements are suspicious and generally illegal. Uh, there's an example in your text about the group confinement of a, a whole neighborhood of Russian Jews in 1892, uh, obviously improper and illegal. And of course, um, social distancing measures, when they're undertaken by the government, must observe procedural due process. Uh, we mentioned earlier about Casey Hickox, American nurse, uh, working with Doctors Without Borders in West Africa in the uh, uh, 2013 Ebola uh, epidemic there. Uh, upon her entry, re-entry to the United States, uh, she was um, uh, tested for temperature uh, and uh, there was a false reading of a slight fever. Uh, she was immediately quarantined, I believe, for 48 hours, possibly 72 hours against her will in Newark with very little communication. Uh, and then finally, she was released to return to her, to her home in Maine. Uh, but uh, in doing so, she had promised to uh, abide by the protocols uh, uh, established by the governor in Maine. When she got to Maine, however, she defied those protocols as well, litigated with the state of Maine, uh, ultimately settled that because her time of isolation had expired. Uh, but then uh, ultimately she sued uh, Governor Christie back here in New Jersey, claiming that he had violated her civil rights by quarantining her uh, without just cause. Turns out she did not have Ebola. I left that out, that's pretty important. And that temperature uh, taken, which resulted in her quarantine, was, was an aberration. It was a false reading. And uh, subsequent tests and, and temperature takings uh, re never revealed another uh, heightened uh, temperature. So uh, clearly, uh, they could have done a better job with Casey Hickox. Um, so I've uh, appended uh, to mo Module 3 a law review article um, about Casey Hickox, but you can also read about that uh, elsewhere in the uh, in the news media. It was a pretty notorious case about five years ago, and uh, we used to center a case study uh, on it. Uh, but uh, because we're right in the middle of COVID, it's more interesting that we do something that uh, revolves around uh, the current thinking on COVID and uh, some of the issues that arise under. Uh, the social distancing protocols uh, that we're dealing with as uh, as a group now. Okay, finally, I've given you here uh, something perhaps no teacher has ever given you, which is a cheat sheet. I call it my Bill of Rights cheat sheet. 
And the design of the uh, study aid is to help you link the issues that you find in case studies and in your readings with the legal and constitutional concepts we've been discussing over the past few weeks. You'll see that um, I've created a chart which lists across the top of it uh, the amendments which you'll most likely encounter, the first, second, fourth, fifth, eighth, and 14th amendments. Down the left side, I've listed the rights which are conferred by each of those amendments. And um, finally, um, examples in the public health field of when those rights might be implicated in the public health context. Bear in mind that the Bill of Rights applies across the board to all sorts of things, uh, but the examples I've given you here are limited to the public health field because that's the focus of our study. So have fun with this. Uh, if you have questions about it, uh, address them to me by email or in our Zoom meetings, uh, but I think you will find this helpful.